Well, basically, I believe that there is an argument for biblical creation, the Bible in general, that is so powerful that there is no refutation to it. Hello, this is Voice of Reason, with a new video series called Debunking Creationists. My first subject is Dr. Jason Lyle, a Ph.D. astrophysicist and young Earth creationist who claims he has absolute proof of creation. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start with some scientific evidence that people often use, and I'll show you that this is good stuff, but you know it falls short of an, of an ultimate proof. Uh, we have, for example, DNA, and it's, it's ironic that the discoverers of DNA were atheists, and they thought when they found DNA, oh, we've disproved God, and it turns out DNA is one of the most marvelous evidences, I think, for God, one of them. Oh, it sure is. I mean, God encoded all the instructions to make us on a molecule. I mean, we put something on a Blu-ray, we think we're so clever, God puts it on a molecule. It's think incredible, it. yeah. And so all these instructions are there. Now it's interesting because these instructions cannot come about by chance. You see, DNA has this information in it, and it turns out that that never comes about by chance. In fact, uh, Dr. Lee Spetner says all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. And so the idea that, that, that DNA could evolve by mutations and natural selection, it's not possible because it's in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. And if, if information can't come from mutation, then someone had to originally plant the information. That's right. The laws of information science tell us that information always originates in a mind. And so you see that's consistent with biblical creation. It sure is. Dr. Lyle makes two key arguments here regarding DNA. One claim is that information can only be created by an intelligent mind, so DNA must have been written by God. Biologists and geneticists do talk about DNA as a code or a language which holds information. They also call it a blueprint or a recipe for making a living organism, but these are just analogies. DNA is unique. It carries information in a way that no other natural or man-made system does. It is part of a chemical process. There is no intelligence writing or reading DNA. Rather, DNA self-replicates, and the chemical properties of the copies of DNA directly affect the production of proteins and those proteins affect how the new organism develops. So to claim it must be intelligent like human instructions is to make a false analogy. Just because it has similarities to information systems doesn't mean you can apply laws of information science to it. This false analogy is equivalent to saying that the DNA molecule is shaped like a twisted ladder, so there must be a tiny creature climbing the ladder. Both are equally fallacious. Furthermore, mutations cause DNA to blindly change the information without any regard for what that change will affect. This can hardly be compared to communicating, it is really scrambling. Most mutations have a neutral effect on the information, some have a negative effect, and some have a beneficial effect. If God were the author of the DNA code, why is it constantly changing, and not always in a positive direction? In fact, mistakes pile up, and genomes are filled with a lot of worthless junk, extra redundant copies, and broken genes that no longer function, like the gene to make vitamin C in humans and other higher primates. It doesn't sound very intelligent to me. And some mutations can have devastating effects, causing birth defects, Down syndrome, and susceptibility to diseases. The other claim that Lyle makes about DNA is that there is no mechanism for adding information to the genome. This tired old creationist claim is completely unfounded. It ignores the fact that parts of gene sequences are often duplicated, which occur in a few different ways that are well understood by biologists. Once a gene sequence is duplicated, the extra copy is free to mutate in ways that produce different proteins, while the original sequence can remain intact. If this does not constitute new information, then you shouldn't be calling DNA information in the first place. Dr. Lee Spetner's book, Not By Chance, is not peer-reviewed, and it has been criticized for conflicting with the scientific literature. To say that point mutations don't add information to the genome ignores the fact that gene duplication followed by mutation has been demonstrated to do exactly that. To be clear, Mutation does happen by chance, but evolution is not a purely chance process. Mutations provide variety in the genome for natural selection to act on. Over many generations, 
Natural selection will tend to eliminate the detrimental genes from the population and tend to propagate the genes that provide a survival benefit. And because of this selection, beneficial changes accumulate, leading to new species. Whenever a creationist uses the word chance, as Dr. Lyle did, they are intentionally or ignorantly ignoring the action of natural selection, which is not chance and not random. The evidence clearly shows that mutation and natural selection is the way evolution happens, with no supernatural entity needed. In fact, DNA provides conclusive evidence that different species share common ancestry because we can trace DNA commonalities, including non-functional DNA, through the family tree of life in living organisms. Creationism offers no valid explanation for this. I described this more fully in my video, The Evidence for Evolution Made Easy. But we can also move to the realm of outer space. That's my uh, area of uh, expertise. And I want to talk about comets, for example. Now, uh, comets, of course, they're made up of ice and dirt. And they have, uh, they have tails. And they follow these uh, very eccentric orbits that they swing out. And they're hard to predict for that reason. They're, they're motions in the night sky because they're not always in the plane of the solar system. Whenever you see a comet's tail, that means that comet is getting smaller. It's losing mass. And it's been estimated that a typical comet can last for no more than about 100,000 years. After that, it's running out of material because the sun's blasting away that, that uh, material into space. And so we know comets just don't last that long. And so you see, that's an evidence of a young solar system, I believe, that it's thousands, not millions or billions of years old. Lyle now offers some very weak evidence, not against evolution itself or for creation, but against an old universe. Even if what he says is true, that a typical comet lasts no more than 100,000 years, it's not, this does not get him anywhere close to the six to 10,000 years he thinks the entire universe is, as he freely admits. But I know why he doesn't really even try to prove a young universe, because he knows he can't. In addition to multiple overlapping radiometric dating methods, the list of ways we know the universe is old is overwhelming. He would have to disprove evidence from coral formation, ice layering, continental drift, cosmogenic nuclides, erosion, geomagnetic reversals, impact craters, iron manganese nodule growth, Nyika megacrystals, distant starlight, and many, many more. And it may seem, of course I could list all kinds of lines of evidence like that, and it may seem that, that those refute evolution, and they refute the long ages, but they really don't. They don't prove creation. And the reason for that is for each one of these lines of evidence, an evolutionist can always invoke what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a hypothesis or a story that saves his worldview from what, what seems to be contrary evidence. And so in the case of comets, my secular colleagues, they, they know, that they, you know that they don't last very long. And so they say, well, there's, there must be this Oort cloud that generates new comets, a big comet generator that throws new ones in as the old ones disintegrate. Now, if I were to ask uh, one of my secular colleagues, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, oh, well, no. But if he's clever, he'll say, but you can't prove it's not there. <laughs> and that's true, I can't. That's arguing from, from nothing is not a very good argument. That's right, it's not. But, but he is technically right. I can't sure. disprove an no, ore cloud. And for that reason, yeah. comets don't prove a young solar system. Because there that's could right. be an ore cloud. I don't believe that's there right. is. But there could be, hypothetically. Or, you know, even the information in DNA. You could say, well, there's some unknown process that generates that information. We just, you know, give us time, we'll find it, right? And so for that reason, we need a different kind of argument if we're going to actually prove biblical creation. Okay, now we see where Lyle is really going with this. He talked about comets so that he could introduce this idea of a rescuing device. He claims the Oort cloud is used by scientists to rescue their argument. Essentially, he's saying that the Oort cloud hypothesis is a special pleading fallacy. A special pleading is when you introduce special conditions, which themselves are unknown or unverifiable, to explain an unknown. The problem with applying the special pleading fallacy, or rescuing device as Lyle calls it, to the Oort cloud is that scientists aren't using it to rescue anything. Comets have been observed for centuries. The Oort cloud is simply a hypothesis about where they come from, not an attempt to prove an old solar system as Lyle implies. The age of the solar system does not rest on the age of comets, as I have shown. It's true that the Oort cloud has not been directly observed but it has been hypothesized because it fits the data we have. 
This is just science in action. We build models that fit the data and try to find more evidence to confirm or falsify the model. Science has no need for special pleadings because it follows the evidence wherever it leads. If the evidence contradicts in a hypothesis, the hypothesis is thrown out. Creationists cannot do this. They are tied to their foregone conclusion that God made everything. For this reason, they end up employing the special pleading fallacy liberally. When you believe in the supernatural, you have the greatest rescuing device ever invented. All things are possible. So you really free yourself from actually explaining anything. How convenient. Lyle knows this, and he's trying to claim that science does the same, to try to bring it down to his level. And as you will see, he continues with this tactic. Okay. And so we need an argument for our worldview to prove that my way of looking at the evidence is the right way of looking at the evidence. You see, we all have, these, we all have the same facts. We all have the same science. I mean, we, we really have the same evidence. It's not like there's evidence for creation and evidence for evolution. We all have the same evidence. It's how you look at it. We have different, different glasses, as it were, different worldviews. And you can think of that like mental glasses. Like, I like to think of the Bible like prescription lenses that are designed just for you. You put them on, the world snaps into focus, you see things as they are. I think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses, you see red everywhere. It's not that the world is red but your view has been colored by the glasses you're wearing. But my point here is that we all have these worldviews which consist of presuppositions. And so that's just uh, technical jargon for your most basic convictions about reality. What you hold to be true very dearly. You, there are things you already believe before you come to, to, to the evidence. If you come by a rock on the side of the road, you say, well, I think I'm going to do an experiment on that rock. You already believe that your senses are reliable because uh, you see the rock and you, you don't say, well, I see a rock, but there probably isn't a rock there. It's probably my eyes just tricking me again. I mean, pr presumably you say, my senses are reliable most of the time at least. And so that's an example of a presupposition. Now that makes sense in the Christian worldview, but it's something that you assume before you look at the evidence. Lyle continues here to try to bring science down to the level of creationism by misrepresenting how science works and specifically claiming that it relies on presuppositions. Wrong. Science requires only one presupposition, that we all live in a shared physical reality. It's the only thing we cannot prove or disprove with evidence. We could all be in the matrix, or a brain in a vat, with all our memories implanted, but I don't find that very likely. Every other conclusion in science is based on confirmed evidence. The claim that when we look at a rock, we have to presuppose that our senses are reliable is ridiculous. Hmm, let me think. If only there was some way I could, I don't know, independently confirm the rock I see is real? Well, yes, of course there is. First, I might reach out and touch it. If I can feel the rock, now I have two consistent data points that give the same result, my sight and my sense of touch. Then, I can ask a friend if they can see and feel the rock, doubling my data points to four. But let's not stop there. We could both be deluded, so we can test our hypothesis using instruments. We could take a picture of it, and we can put it on a scale and weigh it. Now, in order for the rock to be an illusion, our eyes, fingers, the camera, and the scale would all have to somehow conspire to create the exact same illusion. An extraordinary claim indeed. But we are still not done because we can also make predictions based on what we already know about rocks and test those predictions. For example, I predict that if I throw the rock at a tin can, the can will be knocked over. If the result matches my prediction, I am even more confident still that I have a real rock. All scientific claims are like this. If we can't independently confirm it, test it, and make accurate predictions, it's not settled science. And the more data points we gather, the more ways we can independently verify observations, and the more successful predictions we can make, the more certain we are of our conclusions. Creationists like Lyle try to pretend that's not the case. Why? Because creationism has none of that. All they have is an authoritative book they believe without question, with no way to independently confirm it, test it, or use it to make accurate predictions. They play lip service to evidence without actually providing much, if any, real testable evidence, as Lyle clearly demonstrates in this video. 
and when they try, it is cherry-picked, misrepresented, or otherwise fallacious. Now see, the point here is that creationists and evolutionists have competing worldviews. We have different sets of presuppositions. That's what the debate is really about. It's really not about evidence. That surprises people. It's about how we should interpret evidence. And see, the creationist is looking at the evidence through the perspective that God's word, the Bible, is the ultimate standard. That's what we should be doing anyway. Now the evolutionist, well, there are different types of evolutionists out there, but often they will appeal to naturalism, which is the belief that nature is all that there is or strict empiricism, which is the belief that all truth claims are answered observationally. Yeah, if you want to know something, go out and look at it and taste it and touch it and smell it, whatever. Okay, and so if you have that kind of worldview, that disallows God, and you're going to have to think about things that way. When Lyle talks about naturalism here, he fails to distinguish between philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism. Philosophical naturalism does claim to exclude the supernatural, but only methodological naturalism, which makes no such claim, is required to do science. Methodological naturalism is just the way science looks for natural answers. Many thousands of phenomena, which in the past were thought to be supernatural, were discovered to be natural by science, such as the movement of the planets, rainbows, lightning, eclipses, just to name a few. When science can't find a natural cause, it just keeps looking for evidence. It doesn't throw up its hands and say, supernatural force did it, because supernatural forces have never been demonstrated. But natural forces have. You can't explain an unknown with another unknown. And that is all that empiricism really means, making observations of reality and looking for their causes based on what we already know. Also, scientists always consider plausibility when making a claim. A claim is more likely to be true if it fits with the causes we already understand. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Creationists claim that natural evolution is implausible, while hiding behind the fact that their explanation has zero plausibility. Exactly how is the supernatural supposed to work? They never say. God is supposedly a non-physical being that somehow has the ability to create and control physical matter. I am reminded of the story in the New Testament, in which Jesus and his disciples are on a boat that is suddenly overtaken by a storm. Jesus simply says the words, Peace, be still, and the wind and rain, in the words of the apostles, obey his commands. Do they seriously believe that mindless matter like raindrops and air molecules, can obey commands? How does that work? Or perhaps God uses some extremely complex physical force to individually affect raindrops and the wind directly. Either way is hopelessly implausible, and at the very least, requires further explanation. It simply cannot be a final explanation. If the supernatural does exist, then it must somehow manifest in some way in the physical universe, and therefore we would, at least in principle, be able to detect it. And yet, no supernatural cause has ever been demonstrated under reasonable experimental conditions. Science does not presuppose that the supernatural does not exist, as Lyle claims. It just reserves judgment on anything that has not been demonstrated. Now, evidence by itself is never decisive when it comes to a worldview issue. And, so, and, that, and that's where a lot of people run into trouble. They think, well, if I just had enough evidence, yes. I could convince my opponent. You can't. And see, the reason for that, you might, you might have this great evidence that the Bible's true. I do think that fossils are fantastic evidence of a worldwide flood. They make sense. But that's because I'm looking at it through the lens of Scripture. I'm looking at it properly through the lens of Scripture. My secular colleague, he's going to look at that same evidence. He's going to say, that's not how I see it. He's going to have a rescuing device. He says, no, I think fossils are laid down over millions of years. And slowly, and this proves old earth and so on. And you know what we're inclined to say? We're inclined to say, well, maybe that's not such a good evidence then, because it didn't convince him. Well, that's not the case. It's perfectly good evidence. He's just looking at it wrong. Yeah. Wait, fossils prove Noah's flood? The fossil record grades clearly and unmistakably from simple life forms to more complex ones. If the fossils we found were due to a catastrophic flood event, all of the different fossil species would be mixed together in the same layers. They are not. We never find fossils out of the order predicted by evolution. There is no reasonable way a flood would order the fossils the way we see them. 
This is what I meant when I said they misconstrue the evidence. Clearly, it is the creationists that are looking at the evidence wrong. They have to, to fit their authoritative book. And so we come up with a different evidence. Well, how about now? What about the canyons? They can form quickly. And he says, well, yeah, that one did, but that doesn't mean they all do. And we say, well, rock layers can be laid down quickly. You know, Mount St. Helens proved that. He says, well, just because those rocks were laid down quickly doesn't mean that these rocks were laid down quickly. And Again, he's misconstruing the evidence. Here is a canyon that formed quickly, and here is a canyon that formed slowly. See if you can spot the difference. Also, the Mount St. Helens volcanic flood layers were laid down quickly, but it is easy to see the difference between these layers and the vast majority of sedimentary layers found all around the world. The layering we see in flood formations is largely due to the differences of sizes of the rock particles settling out at different levels. This is called hydrodynamic sorting. In contrast, in long-term sedimentary layers, we find many different kinds of rocks, not sorted by size, and even surface features between the layers, including mud cracks, footprints, burrows, shorelines, wind erosion, sand dunes, and of course, varying fossil species, and many more that could not have formed in a catastrophic event. See, the evidence really does matter. It's not that we are interpreting the evidence differently. It is that science considers all the evidence, while Lyle and other creationists dishonestly cherry-pick what seems to fit and ignore the rest. So, uh, although it's fine to show people evidence, that by itself is not going to persuade them, nor should it, because you haven't made an argument for my worldview. And so what I want to do today is say, how do we then argue for a worldview? How do I show that my presuppositions, my worldview is the right way of looking at the evidence, and his is the wrong way of looking at the evidence? And you can't do that just by using the evidence, because that's not what it's about. It's about how we should look at it. But you see, what I'm going to argue is that only the Bible can make sense of those things that are necessary for knowledge. And the technical jargon for those are preconditions of intelligibility. Those are things that would have to be true in advance in order for knowledge to be possible. You see, in order for us to have knowledge of logic, logical reasoning, certain things would have to already be true. There would have to already be laws of logic, for example. So that's a precondition of intelligibility. Uh, for us to have knowledge of ethics, there would have to already be in existence laws of morality. And yes. so that's a precondition of intelligibility. And so those things would have to be true. Now, my point is that only the Bible can make sense of those preconditions of intelligibility. And therefore, my argument for the truth of the Bible is that unless the Bible is true, you can't prove that anything is true. Wow. And that's a different kind of argument than most people are used to. It's very powerful, and it's based on what the Bible itself says about the nature of knowledge. And so there are these things that we all rely upon to have knowledge, things like laws of logic, which gives us deductive reasoning, uh, things like uniformity in nature, which is that there's this orderliness to nature. I'm not talking about uniformitarianism, which is the idea that rates and conditions are constant. I don't believe that. It might be raining on Monday and sunny on Friday. Conditions change. But the laws of nature... There, there are these laws that are the law consistent. Of gravity and so forth. Exactly. Gravity works the same. Change. They're not going to change. And yeah. God has promised us yeah. that. And we have only the promise of God, by the way, he's built, to guarantee he's that. He's built order into his creation. That's right. Yes. And we rely upon that. Yes. And we need that to do science, you see. So it makes sense. It stems right from God's word. Okay. Now we see that Lyle has completely given up on evidence and apparently is giving up on reasoned argument as well. Instead, he makes a series of a particular type of unsupported assertions known collectively as presuppositional apologetics. If we describe the creation versus evolution debate as a chess game, where each argument or presentation of evidence is a chess move, then presuppositional apologetics is equivalent to grabbing the opponent's king, knocking the board over, and declaring victory. It is a childish way to argue, and worse, it's blatantly dishonest and hopelessly circular. It makes absurd assertions it cannot possibly support with reason, evidence, or independent confirmation. Lyle asserts that the laws of logic, the laws of nature, and morality can only come from God. Let me show you how absurd this is. What are the laws of logic? Well, they are just descriptions of how reality itself works. The most commonly talked about logical law is the law of non-contradiction, which states that something cannot be A, whatever A is defined as, and not A at the same time. 
This is called a law for the simple reason that it must be true. The contrary is impossible. If A were also not A, it would necessarily change what it means to be A. So it becomes an absurdity. Another way to look at the law of non-contradiction is to try to think of a round square or a married bachelor. By definition, these cannot exist. Lyle gives credit to God for creating and for enforcing this law. Yet, it needs no creating or enforcing. Any possible reality would work like this, with or without a God. The laws of logic exist necessarily. Like the concept of numbers. Does it take a God for the abstract concept of one and two to exist? No. They would exist even if there were no humans to understand them and no God to make them. This is called metaphysical necessity. You simply cannot say that they require a God because it is impossible for them to not exist. He makes a similar claim about the laws of nature, like gravity. Natural laws are just descriptions of how physical matter interacts. Gravity acts the same everywhere in the universe because all normal matter in the universe, at its basest level, is made up of atoms that have mass, and gravity is the interaction of that mass. There is no reason we would expect that interaction to change. In fact, if it did change, that would require an explanation. Do you see what Lyle is actually doing here? He has claimed that it takes a god for things to change, like creation of new species or new information in genes. And now he claims that it takes a god to prevent matter from changing. Boy, that god of his really can't lose. Another presuppositionalist, Cy Ten Bruggenkate, puts it this way. Now, according to the atheistic worldview, we live in a world that's only made of matter and is constantly changing. How do you get universal laws which forbid contradictions in a worldview like that? Wow. This implies that we think that all things just change without cause. That couldn't be more wrong. Physical things change only when a physical force acts on them. It certainly doesn't take a god to keep gravity from changing, unless you can demonstrate a force that could change it. The same is true for all the physical laws of nature. They are called laws because they do not change, and there is no known force that could change them. Lyle is an astrophysicist. Physics is the study of how physical forces work. He really has no excuse for making nonsense claims like this. We know all the physical forces, and none of them have any reason to change, so it doesn't take a god to hold them in place. He also claims morality can only come from a god, but he's going to expand on that further, so I'll wait and comment after that. Yes. And so my point is that if God created this, right and wrong makes sense, because he will have yes. the right to set the rules we're made in his image. We're not just rearranged pawn scum. It, we're, we're responsible to God for our actions. That's right. And he will hold us accountable for our actions. And so we have a very good reason to behave in a if particular way. If there's a maker, way. there's a judge. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so my question is, if there's no God, then why behave in a particular way? I mean, maybe it has survival value, but aside from that, uh, why would we have a moral code? And so, you know, if Adam is in your past, if God made you, then he owns you and he has the right to make the rules. Amen. But if ape is in your past, if you're just, again, rearranged pawn scum, then you own yourself. There's, there's, you're not accountable to anybody other than yourself. Now, some people might say, that's right. Morality is relative. Everybody gets to make up their own moral code. And therefore, you can't go around telling other people what not to do. Don't and you the, impose and, your morality that's right. on me. That's yes. right. And when, when they say that, what are they doing? They're imposing their morality on you. You yeah. see, they're saying, you they're can't like do that. this. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so they're being inconsistent. And if you really press them to, you'll find nobody really believes in relative morality. Um, how do you decide right from wrong? That's what I want to ask my unbelieving friend. It, it doesn't matter if he has a secular worldview or another religious worldview. Unless he's appealing to the, the biblical God, he's really not going to be able to account for an absolute moral code, especially the one that, that we have. And, uh, he's not even going to acknowledge an absolute moral code. He may not. If he does, he, but he won't be able to give a good reason for, for it. it. That's right. If everything's right. by random chance, there's yeah. no reason for a moral code, for an absolute moral code. That's, That's right. right. Okay. And, I, and I thought, you know, I, well, I want to give people a, a preview of some possible responses that they might get. So what, yes. what, what might people say when you say this? Well, they, people might say, well, no, you don't need God 
for, for good. Good is what brings the most happiness to the most people. That's, That's the utili That's right. utilitarian yeah. standard. And, you know, and, and maybe you're thinking, well, yeah, we, we should be concerned about the happiness of others, and that's true in the Christian worldview, you see. But if we're just chemicals, why should I be concerned about the happiness of chemicals? If happiness is just a chemical reaction in the brain, why should I try and achieve that particular chemical reaction as opposed to some other? Maybe pain, whatever brings the most pain to the most people is what's good. And see, they'd reject that. But my point is, why, what makes their opinion any better than any other opinion? And even here, they're subtly borrowing, borrowing on the Christian worldview, aren't they? Because they're saying, you don't need God to, de to determine good. Just do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard that somewhere yeah, before, haven't you? Yeah, I like you? the guy that said that first. <laughs> That's okay. right. Yeah. So again, they're standing on the Christian worldview, arguing against the Christian worldview. Um, consider an evolutionist who's outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, How, that man shot that little girl. That's terrible. He should go to jail. And I'm, I'm glad he believes that. I do right. too. But my point is, in his worldview, why should he be angry? In his worldview, it's just one chemical accident getting rid of another chemical accident. What is the big deal, right? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get angry right. at baking soda for reacting with vinegar. That's just what you're, chemicals you're, do. You're just bringing their, their position to its logical conclusion. That's right. That's what you want to do. You want to That's force right. them to be consistent with what uh -huh. they say they believe. Okay, Lyle, here I am, your unbelieving friend, here to answer your question, how do you decide right from wrong? The answer is so simple. Whatever hurts someone is wrong. All normal humans have empathy for one another, and to some extent other animals, because we know what it feels like to be hurt. That is really all we need to make moral decisions. We can carefully examine our actions and determine whether they are likely to cause harm. If you are talking about any actions that don't harm others, then you are simply not talking about morality. For example, the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. But why? Because God doesn't like it? Does it offend God or hurt his feelings? What kind of a God can be hurt? If your God is good and loves us, as you say, then hurting humans would be what he cares about most anyway. Lyle presents a false dichotomy. Either there is an absolute morality, or everyone makes up their own morality. This is called moral relativism. I reject both. The Bible does a terrible job of providing an absolute morality. The first four of the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with morality. They are just rules about worshiping God. The rest are just obvious rules that anyone could come up with without a God. There is no admonition of slavery in the entire Bible. In fact, it is perfectly okay with slavery and says you can beat your slaves. There is a commandment against murder, but other verses in the Bible command stoning people for arbitrary crimes like gathering sticks on the Sabbath, so it is morally inconsistent at best. If the Bible really were your moral guide, then you would be a terrible person. If Lyle really follows the morality of the Bible exclusively as the absolute authority, then he should be perfectly okay with the still existent slave trade. But I'm sure he isn't. In reality, his own sense of empathy tells him that slavery is wrong, even though the Bible doesn't. Otherwise, he has to pretend he knows what God wants, despite what the Bible says, or claim God tells him directly. But how can directly revealed morality be absolute? It can't, because it would rely on fallible humans to get the message right. But I am also not an advocate of moral relativism. I am not saying that everyone makes up their own rules that are equally valid. We can, indeed, tell other people that they are doing wrong by pointing out that they are hurting people. That is the only standard we need, and the only one that makes sense, regardless of your worldview. And that's what all societies attempt to do. Of course, societies do get this wrong. But the way to point out that it is wrong is to point out that it unfairly hurts people. Lyle really touched on the answer, but discounted it. Whatever provides the most happiness to the most people is moral. And you don't need a God for that, because both believers and non-believers value others and feel empathy. Lyle also mentions do unto others, commonly known as the golden rule, which is stated in the New Testament. And I agree that it is actually a pretty good rule of thumb for morality. But apparently... Lyle doesn't know that it is not exclusive to Christianity and actually predates the New Testament by centuries.
Confucius, who died in 479 BCE, said, Never impose on others what you would not choose for yourself. And an ancient Egyptian proverb states, Now this is the command, do to the doer, to cause that he do thus to you. Morality is just another thing that Christians take credit for without justification. Do they really think that mankind didn't know that murder was wrong before the Bible was written, or that we couldn't figure it out without an absolute authority? And worst of all, they assert that if we didn't come from God, then we have no value at all. As Lyle said, we shouldn't care if other people are hurt, if we are just rearranged pond scum. But why should it matter if we are naturally created or magically created? Either way, we are thinking beings with feelings and empathy. For further explanation, I highly recommend a video called The Superiority of Secular Morality by Matt Dillahunty, and also Sam Harris's outstanding book, the moral landscape. These two completely decimate the Christian moral argument much better than I can do here. But I have made my point. I have shown that there is no basis for attributing morality, the laws of logic, and the laws of nature to a supernatural being, and thus the presuppositional argument fails. I will spare you the rest of the video because it turns to preaching and makes no more claims about creation or evolution. In his presentation, Lyle fails to make a reasoned case for creation. In trying to do so, he demonstrates how creationists incorrectly and fallaciously deal with the evidence. They misconstrue it, and they cherry-pick it. This is what happens when you start with a conclusion which absolutely must be right, regardless of the evidence. Rather than actually trying to refute the multiple lines of confirmed evidence we have for evolution, or presenting a serious evidential case for creation, he intentionally misrepresents and maligns the process of science itself. He wants us to believe that science is based on unsupported presuppositions and special pleadings, just like creationism. Nothing could be further from the truth. His presuppositional argument relies on unfounded assertions that I have shown to be false. Lyle essentially admits that evidence is not able to prove creation. He even said it's not about the evidence. But I ask, why not? If God created the world and all life, there is no valid reason that the evidence would not clearly show it, or at least be consistent with it. Instead, the more we examine it, the more we see a natural world with no need and no justification to evoke a supernatural creator to explain it. Thanks for watching.